Uh, indeed. Hello, everybody. I've just joined, um, so I've not been listening to the other presentations. On my screen here, it says 26 attendees, so I'm gratified that somebody's taking the trouble. So, hello to you all. Um, so, Janine, you're going to move the slides when I ask. Is that how it works? Yep, that's right. All right. So, while we're on the front slide here, perhaps I could just quickly introduce the company that I'm representing. The IT Power Group is a UK-based renewable energy consulting company that was established back in uh, 1981. Um, it's a fairly small company, but we have uh, a, quite a wide geographical spread. We have offices in the UK, obviously, but uh, in Australia, where I'm based, in Canberra, um, also a big office in India and a slightly smaller office in China, um, plus one or two others, including um, Floor, who's in Argentina, who may even be listening in, I'm not sure. Um, so that's the IT Power Group. What I want to talk about today is fairly non-technical. Um, it's about CSP modelling specifically, and a project that we've done in Australia to improve the accessibility for, um, let's say, people who are not already experienced with SAM, um, but we wish to make it into a, a tool that was better accessible for people who are interested, hadn't previously worked with it, but we wanted to make it a... Um, educational tool for CSP capabilities as well. So I think we'll jump to the next slide. And for completeness here, I've just included photographs of the four CSP types, which I'm sure everybody who's listening is familiar with, so we won't spend too much time on that. Um, but just to remind everybody, I guess, that... Uh, Concentrating solar power as an industry globally is 95% trough systems using steam turbines. Um, and the, uh, the SAM and uh, NREL um, resources that are available have cases already established, both hypothetical cases for troughs, towers, fresnel and dishes, um, but also some notable um, verified real cases, and these were the basis for the, starting the work that we did. So the next slide, please, Janine. So a little bit of background on where CSP is in Australia at the moment. This slide here, and you might like to hit carriage return again, Janine, for the inset. Um, this slide shows the linear Fresnel solar boost project that's um, getting close to commissioning at the moment in uh, one of our northern states in Queensland. So it's an add-on to an existing coal-fired power station, which will be equivalent to 44 megawatts electrical. So at, in Australia at the moment, that will be our one and only proper commercial-sized utility-scale CSP system. Um, but the, the area of CSP has been subject to quite a lot of interest. We have had an attempt to, with a, with a policy program from our federal government, to establish a larger system, um, which hasn't happened as yet. So, so the whole issue of what can CSP do, what will it cost, what will be the cost of energy, um, and also getting people to understand the various... Um, extra values that it brings, particularly through energy storage. So, next slide, please, Janine. And on that note, it's no surprise to anyone, I think, to say that thermal energy storage is CSP's big competitive advantage amongst the renewable energies at the moment, and it's the two tank molten salt configuration that's dominating. Um, and there is a very key point that, given that we have essentially the same two-tank molten salt approach applied to either troughs or towers, we see an immediate advantage for the tower systems in that the 
same salt inventory, if you will, cycles between a, a cold tank temperature and a hot tank temperature that's hotter in the case of the tower plants. So we've stored more energy for the same inventory of salt and hence that makes the whole um, energy storage component of a tower plant cheaper than it is in a trough plant. And as we'll see in a minute, that flows through to the results that we get in levelised cost of energy. So next one, please, Janine. Now, <clears throat> IT Power completed a fairly major what we could call a CFP road mapping study for Australia back in 2012. This is something that we did for the what was then called the Australian Solar Institute. Um, it's now the Australian Solar Institute has now been rolled into a new federal government agency called the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA. Um, so this 2012 report looked at the potential and what we thought the costs might be. Um, what the likely income could be um, and what the barriers and maybe steps to actually getting CSP to work in Australia. Um, one of the key findings was that despite the fact that the electrical network in Australia only really covers 25 to 30% of the continent, um, most of our population is not in the best DNI resource areas. But despite that, the network extends inland to areas where the DNI resource is very, very good by world standards. Um, so anything up to 15 gigawatts of installed capacity could be easily um, coped with without major grid extensions. We also examined using SAM um, to predict the output of a sort of baseline trough system, which we actually took from one of the models of the configured for the Nevada Solar One, but we ran that in various locations in Australia, um, particularly a site called Longreach in Queensland, which, so essentially what we were doing there is choosing to run the most um, conservative technology configuration of a CSP plant in what would be one of the very best available uh, network connected sites in Australia. Um, so with that, we, were, we established that the LCOE would be $250 a megawatt hour, that's Australian dollars in 2012, essentially the same as the US dollar at that time. Um, but also we looked at the output on a half hourly basis and compared that with the historical data for from the wholesale electricity market in Australia, which varies on a half hourly basis, and by multiplying the two together and looking at the income that could be derived, um, we were able to establish that a system with energy storage um, dispatched in a reasonably optimum way could be earning two times the average of the wholesale price. Um, so that's the good news, if you will. But on the other hand, in Australia at the moment, we the income that one could um, expect to earn with an un unsubsidised CSP plant is the wholesale price of electricity plus extra income one can derive from a renewable energy certificate market in Australia. Um, but that's still the, the combination of those two only really adds up to about $110 a megawatt hour. So we've got quite a large cost gap still in the absence of some form of grant funding to actually get the first project over the line. On the other hand, if we make a reasonable assessment of learning curve cost reductions that we might expect to see um, in correlation with global deployment levels, it seems not unrealistic to imagine that in Australia, from that starting point, we could see cost convergence sometime from six to 18 years. So that's the background. Um, it's a publicly available report, which you can find from the link that's in the final bullet point there. Next slide, please, Janine.
So a quick map of Australia to put things into context. Um, it's a DNI map with an overlay of geographical areas which we've identified as the kind of various market segments. The, the sort of light, large, white, fuzzy area in the middle is essentially all of our off-grid region where there is some market for relatively small CSP systems um, up to several hundred megawatts in total, but really it's the, the purple and the diagonal line hashed area towards the east coast that's the focus of attention more than anything else. Um, the site of Longreach that comes up as our baseline for consideration is towards the um, middle to top right-hand side of the continent, um, some 400 or so kilometres inland and a bit north of Brisbane that's marked there. Um, you can see on this map that the, the network lines, it's a fairly busy map, um, but the network lines only um, go inland to some 500 kilometres or so from the coast. Next one, please, Janine. So a key part of the study that we did was to establish the capital costs of CSP plants at that time to the best we could do. Um, and to do this, we, we surveyed the available literature for costs um, that was available at the time for, for any systems in the world and tried to sort of deconstruct this into parameters that could be used for estimating the cost. And at first glance, this might appear similar to other tables we see in other publications. But what we tried to do with this was do it in a technology neutral way and actually present the cost parameters in a slightly different way to normal. So what you see there, for example, is that a concentrator field, which is taken to indicate any of the concentrator types, and it's the concentrator field, meaning the heliostat field or the troughs, but excluding the receivers and the HTF. So often when we see a, an entry for solar field for a trough system, it includes the receivers and maybe the HTF network. Where we're excluding it, and we're actually expressing it in terms of dollars per kilowatt thermal capacity delivered to the power island. So we're not expressing it in dollars per square metre, for example. And by doing it in this way and excluding the receivers, the analysis that we did suggested that at the present, well, in 2012 at least, we could do that in a virtually technology-neutral way and hence come up with a single approach to costing CSP systems at that time. The, the one distinction is, however, the thermal storage systems. And what we did there was to say that from a baseline of $80 per kilowatt hour thermal of installed capacity, we've also got a scale factor where we're relating it to the temperature limits of the hot and cold store. So this was the, the technology neutral cost numbers that we had. Um, and this is what we took into the project that I'm talking about today. So next one, please, Janine. Um, just to sort of illustrate how those slightly unfamiliar cost parameters translate into numbers that people are more used to, which might be dollars per installed kilowatt electrical. And of course, um, something we all need to emphasize when talking about CSP plants is that we can't just bandy about a single dollar per installed kilowatt number, it depends enormously on what relative solar multiples and amounts of storage we have in the system. Next one, please, Janine. So wh where did that study get us to? There's a range of challenges for CSP in Australia. The biggest one is that there's this huge gap between the cost of energy one could achieve and the incomes one could earn. So frank, fundamentally, without a government policy measure, some kind of um, reduced cost finance, grant scheme, 
or similar or, or preferred feed-in tariff, um, then we won't have any CSP deployment in Australia. The picture I showed you of the Kogan Creek Solar Boost system is indeed an example of that. It has prop, uh, something like 30% grant funding that's actually caused it to be built. Um, so that's number one, but there are other challenges as well, and probably the biggest one on that list is the need to build confidence in Australia among off-takers, financiers, governments and other stakeholders. And as you can see from the arrow there, that's exactly what we've tried to address here by working with SAM to make it a tool that um, individuals in stakeholder organisations like that could realistically pick up if they had sufficient interest and help to learn about the capabilities of CSP. Next one, please. So everybody here obviously is very familiar with the system advisor model and its ability to predict generation and cost of energy for a range of technologies and the fact that there's probably been uh, to the best of my knowledge anyway, the largest amount of work with SAM has been in the CSP systems. It offers the half hourly time resolution, but um, for those of you in the audience who may not be from the US, I suspect, like me, you found when you first um, engaged with SAM that the financial settings inside there are very US specific. So. This project that I'm reporting on today is very much about looking at the financial aspects. It was a project that was done under the auspices of Ostella, that's the Australian Solar Thermal Energy Association. It was executed by IT Power. Um, the NREL team, Nate Blair and his team there in um, Colorado have been very much part of this and helped us a great deal. The funding came from our Australian Renewable Energy Agency. The aim was to improve the accessibility um, to a tool that helps quantify and understand the value proposition for CSP. Next one, please, Janine. So what we see here is essentially the final results. Uh, it's a web page, and you can see the link this is just a screen grab of the web page. It's only been made live in the last week or so. The project was completed uh, some months or, or so back, um, but we've been waiting for the go-ahead from the agency arena to actually mount, mount this publicly, which it now is. So ostella.org.au slash projects brings you up to this page. and. Um, Excuse the smallness of the font uh, in the presentation here, but what you can see is that fundamentally there's three links down the bottom there, and those will get you to the first link is an Australian companion guide to SAM for concentrating solar power, which is obviously a PDF document. Um, then the second link, a zip file, which is a collection of SAM project files with financial settings for Australian conditions. Third link, a selection of solar data files for input to SAM for selected representative Australian sites and years. So now I'd just like to talk you through these three deliverables that we've produced and um, what they're all about. Next one, please, Janine. So the Australian Companion Guide, this is the document, um, what are we trying to do there? Um, I guess everybody who's on this call would know very well that the SAM help system, which is available as a PDF document, is a, a very, very long, detailed and comprehensive document that tells us virtually everything we need to know to run SAM. But I put it to you that for a, a first-time user who isn't going to spend a lot of time on it, that's a fairly daunting amount of material to get one's head around and covers, of course, every single option 
in terms of technology and way of using the model. Um, so what what is this Australian Companion Guide? If you like, it's SAM for CSP for Idiots in Australia. Um, it, it's a considerably shorter thing and we take people through step by step what to do, um, but specifically in terms of the cases that we put together and customised. So we, we, we're writing this on the, on the grounds that people will take these cases, um, open them up, run them, learn something from it, and maybe modify them slightly. Um, when they're ready to go off and create their own cases and so forth, then it, it's, at that time they, they can look after themselves and we make the point all the way along that it's to be used in conjunction with the SAM help system. We're not trying to recreate it. To give you an idea, um, is figure three from our document is reproduced there and we've, we've literally showing a screenshot and telling people, look, you've, you've downloaded our cases. Um, what we want you to do is to just use the, the file open um, and then click on one of the cases and get into it that way. Um, don't bother with the rest of the options of actually creating something from scratch at this point. So the, the companion guide contains quite a number of screenshots wherever one of the basic actions is needed. We try to explain it with a screenshot. Next slide, please. So what are the cases, the existing CSP cases that we adapted? Um, we, we've tried to come up with a mix of real system and hypothetical cases for each of the um, technology classes. Um, there they are listed there. I imagine many of you will be familiar with those various ones. Um, note in particular that the, the Andersol one and the Hemisolar cases have recently been published in quite some detail on the NREL website and it's it's very nice to actually offer a system that one can say, look, here's a real system. Um, in, in this case, they're both in Spain, but one can see a photo of it. It's a real system. There's some level of reasonable verification of the modeling results against real systems performance. Um, a, a user in Australia can take that case and then move it around to different locations and run it with its physical parameters unchanged. And of course, what that means is in doing so, they are not running a system that is optimized in terms of its stolen multiple choice versus storage, etc. It's not optimized for that site, but in terms of building confidence amongst stakeholders, the ability to see what a real physical system would do if you hypothetically popped it down on a, on a different site in Australia is the value that that brings. So these different cases are of course organised into project files, so what we've chosen to do is have a project file for all our trough cases, a project file for all our tower cases, and the LFR and the dish sterling one as well. Um, the difference is we have not changed any of the physical parameters from these case files. Um, what we've done is optimise or improve the financial parameters as appropriate for Australian conditions and we've adjusted the cost parameters um, to match our 2012 study um, but chosen to do it via the Excel exchange function. So the cost parameters sit in a spreadsheet, one spreadsheet to match each of the project files and in doing that what we're offering is a set of cost parameters say for the trough project file where the same set of cost parameters are used for each of the trough cases. That's the assumption that we're making. Um, having the Excel exchange function means that um, for a more adventurous user, they can get inside the Excel file and change the cost parameters any way it suits them, but it also allows us to include in the SAM case itself a user variable 
such that from within SAM, the user can scale all the costs by a, a fixed factor um, to reflect what they think might happen in subsequent years or if they feel that our original costing was um, too conservative or not conservative enough, as the case may be. Next slide, please. So making sense of levelised cost of energy in SAM, um, for those of us not from the US, it is actually a bit confusing to begin with. And uh, why is that, what's, what, where does that confusion arise from? Within the SAM LCOE calculation, all of the um, grant-based and production-based incentives are included within the LCOE calculation. So the addition of a production tax credit, for example, in SAM has the effect of lowering the LCOE. Um, it's a sort of philosophical definition, uh, but it's not something that um, stakeholders in Australia are used to. The internal rate of return is also included within the LCOE calculation tool, um, and there's a range of incentives and terminologies which are not, or A, they don't apply, and B, the terminology is unfamiliar to Australians. So, for example, the production tax credit is not something we have. The accelerated cost, uh, cost recovery for taxation purposes is not something we have. So what have we done for the Aussies? We've removed all the incentives from the calculator. Um, we've, to, to make sense of the relationship between discount rate and internal rate of return, um, one specifies target IRR as the, as the mechanism and sets um, as a default the chosen IRR and nominal discount rate to be equal. We have no state taxes. We have state line, straight line 20 year depreciation for our federal tax and a range of other settings in terms of percentages of debt and equity, which are as per our 2012 study. Uh, next slide, please. And specifically, this is the example. Um, so a 64 megawatt trough system, which was nominally modelled on the Nevada Solar One case. Um, what I'm just showing here, and it seems as if the screen's cut off a little bit, I apologise for that, um, is uh, the reconciliation between the calculation that we did previously using our own model um, and this reconciliation with the LCOE calculation in SAM and uh, what you can see is first of all the, the capital cost inputs are pretty close but of course the formulas, the cost parameters are not exactly right but if we take that as essentially the same capital cost input there's a range of user inputs there like 60% um, financing through a loan, a 15-year period, so they are all obviously equal in both columns. Um, but then we come to the calculated values, and what we find is that um, we afraid the very last line that's missing off the screen is the real LCOE um, for energy sales when they're taxed. But the agreement there is essentially the same as the agreement for the nominal LCOE, which is to say it's a variation of less than 1%. So um, we're, we're fairly happy with that, and that we've, we've made sense of the LCOE calculation, and it matches our previous published analysis. Next one, please. So <clears throat> in terms of the technology-specific costing, I, I explained before that in the 2012 study we'd managed to come up with technology neutral cost parameters which are expressed in terms of things like the um, kilowatt thermal of capacity at the power island. To, to populate this back into SAM, we needed to reconstruct the cost parameters that people are more used to, things like 
dollars per square metre of solar field and so forth. So <coughs> the principle we worked on here is to say that as far as we can say in Australia in 2012, the, the $252 per megawatt hour should apply to all technologies equally in the absence of energy storage, but storage makes a difference. We've, we, we sought to achieve some logical consistency across the cases. So, for example, we wished to cost the steam turbine power block the same for any of the tower um, Fresnel trough technologies. We made the assumption that a cost of a heliostat should be the same whether it's a direct steam plant or a molten salt plant. Um, and in putting this together, we've deviated from the definitions of I mean, for those of you who have examined the various CSP cases in SAM, you can sort of see implicitly that, say, when one looks at the Fresnel cases versus the trough cases, that obviously some different assumptions have been made about what constitutes the breakdown between the power block and the balance of plant. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because the two things add up to a capital cost and it all flows through. But to make these cases logically consistent as a whole group, we made the choice that the power block should be equal in all cases, and so we've actually found that the power block numbers are reduced, um, and we're implicitly assuming more in the scope of balance of plant to do that. We've simplified things, so for example, we've just put all the O and M into a single variable, um, a variable cost category for O and M. Um, we've rolled contingencies and and uh, and shared that pro rata over the other cost parameters. Uh, we've got a single number for indirect, so if we we haven't attempted to cost, for example, the value of land or anything like that. And then we've just sort of rounded things up to some extent. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of what this means, so for the trough cases, and as I said before, all the cases are using the same set of cost parameters, the results are the column in green on the right in 2012 Australian dollars, and to compare that with the default values from the various cases as they come from SAM, um, you can see those in the four columns to the left there. So what we see is similar but different. As I said, for example, if one looks at the power plant or the power block, we've now got a smaller number but a higher number in the balance of plant category. But remember also that we're not expecting these to match exactly because this is our translation of US conditions across to Australian dollar conditions as best we could see at that time. So they're similar but not in exact agreement. Next slide, please. What this means is that when we finally look at the LCOEs that come out, we no longer have exact technology neutrality. Um, by putting these parameters in and making them consistent across all the cases, we see quite a deal of variation in the LCOE that comes out for our default site of Longreach in Queensland. The case, the Nevada Solar One 64 megawatt trough case, which is our default, that yields up $252 per megawatt hour. That's the one that we reconciled as the starting point but you can see quite a deal of variation across the others. I, the, what we could say here, I suppose, is that the variation, well, the accuracy of this, I would suggest, is not better than 10%. So when one sees that the, the physical trough model with six hour storage is showing um, 236 versus the 64 megawatt no storage at 250, that's virtually the same thing in a sense 
within the limits of the accuracy. But what does come out here is that the two tower system cases um, show considerably better LCOE performance, considerably lower LCOEs on the strength of their more cost-effective storage solution. And we're actually offering this up as indeed this is a real conclusion that they do perform better. I would make the point though that in taking the physical parameters unchanged for these cases, one of the consequences is that the turbine efficiency assumed for say the, the 100 megawatt tower versus the Hemosol 17 megawatt tower is the same, which is not necessarily that realistic. So um, for the, of those of you who would know, there's a fairly strong dependence of a steam turbine's efficiency on its size, such that one would expect a smaller turbine to be less efficient, that should flow through to a higher cost of energy. And in this modelling, we're not seeing that. We're actually seeing the hemisolar plant modelled as having the same efficiency and therefore coming up with a better LCOE than the 100 megawatt plant. So that, I think, is not entirely realistic at the in the current state of the modelling, but it's okay for the present purposes. Next slide, please. Um, now quickly, just say a little bit about the solar data files. Um, if one goes in to the SAM website and follows the recommendations, it suggests looking at the Energy Plus website for a set of TMY files for essentially any country one chooses to run it. If you go in there and you you follow through and uh, eventually find the files that are offered up for Australia, um, there's a set of EPW format files which actually have their origins in Australia, so it's interesting to pick that up off a, a, an American website, but nonetheless they were actually developed in Australia for building modelling purposes and have subsequently been found to have some faults in them. So not entirely suitable. So we thought we would address that with some more extra solar data files. And the approach we've taken is to offer up some um, real year files rather than actual averaged TMY files. Um, and we've done this in TMY3 format. So that's the the third or the second zip file that one can download from the web page and what we've attempted to do is offer up as close as we can get to based on the the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia data a best, worst and closest to typical year based on that data. Next slide please. And I think I've pretty much used up all the time which is, brings us to the conclusions. So. Final conclusion, SAM is an extremely valuable tool to assist educated stakeholders to understand the capabilities and advantages of CSB systems. This project has attempted to make the financial aspects of SAM in particular more accessible to Australian stakeholders. And uh, whilst the previous study of CSB potential in Australia was technology neutral, um, what we find in this project is that the logical attention to the interpretation of cost factors makes it apparent that tower with salt has a, a very strong present cost advantage. And I'd make the point that that is only so long as the tower solution has the cheapest storage when the other technologies, if and when they can bring their storage costs down, then they're certainly very much in the race still as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for your attention.